So uh, hopefully that's the case. What I want to talk about are cannabinoids, endocannabinoids in particular, but cannabinoids in general, as really global homeostatic regulators, where their functions are not only things that are occurring within cells, but between cells, and then up onto our levels of consciousness, and how that impacts on society as a whole. So we see this tremendous uh, you know, global level of integrated regulation from cannabinoids. And really, it's all an expression of this underlying physics. I kind of like am an evangelical uh, person with respect to this physics because it's something that's not taught very much in the United States in particular, but it, it really just gives you a whole different perspective on everything. So I like to kind of spread that around and see how the cannabinoid system is really an embodiment of that and what kinds of things we might expect as a result of it being that kind of an embodiment. So really what I want to talk about is what is life and how the cannabinoid system plays into that and the perspective that I take is all based on this new physics known as far from equilibrium thermodynamics and how that accounts for really biology and everything else. So this work was all pioneered by Ilya Prigogine who got a Nobel Prize which just looks like an insignificant thing if you have a look at the man's CV. And I love this quote here because it just captures so much about everything. The more deeply we study the nature of time, the better we understand that duration means invention, creation of forms, continuous elaboration of the absolutely new. So what this is saying is that life and the creative qualities associated li with life are a natural extension of physics. So, fact. Large collections of molecules that are at or near equilibrium have fundamentally different properties from those that are far from equilibrium. It's like a discharged battery doesn't do anything and a charged battery can do all sorts of things. So that's kind of the analogy from a chemical point of view. So the molecules act creatively and cooperate. This is something totally bizarre from the old way of thinking and yet it's fundamental reality by the new one. So what are the consequences of that? Life must exist. It's a natural phenomenon. So when energy and mass flow, molecules self-organize and create flow-dependent structures, including prebiotic chemistry that led to life, families, communities, societies, economics, politics, and religion. So what I ultimately want to be talking about is how cannabinoids impact on, on especially politics and how that impacts on our society. Prigogine's work provides a new way of looking at the universe. Unlike Newtonian perspective, there is an arrow to time. The fractal-like reiteration of creative processes powers evolution. And the cannabinoids have such an incredible role in that because they do everything everywhere all the time. Emergent behavior is a fundamental characteristic of far from equilibrium systems. In other words, there's nonlinear change. And what that means is that outcomes of a particular event can't be linearly mapped back to where you started. Something new happens. In other words, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The endocannabinoid system, therefore, because of its all-pervasive role, is a, is a prime and really unique example of, the, of all of this. So, you know, just in general, living systems are really all bioelectric. What we're looking at is the flow of electrons from where they don't want to be, our food, to where they want to be, CO2 and water. Fire extinguishers, the energy's gone. So a prime example of really far from equilibrium phenomena can be seen here in this little movie known as the belazov zabotinsky reaction. And what you're seeing here in a liquid, developing over time, emerging, is organization. In a liquid, of no, typically a liquid is just random molecules. How is it that molecules actually form organized structure? How do they form heterogeneity in a liquid? I mean, it goes totally counterintuitive to everything that we've been taught, but you're looking at it happen. You know, and statistically, this is so improbable. You're talking about 10 mLs of molecule, you know, of, of a liquid and molecules within that 10 mLs forming these organized patterns. Statistically, it's impossible. You know, you got 10 to the 20 molecules. This can't be happening. It can't happen. You just saw it happen. What you're looking at really is the flow of electrons from a specific chemical reaction along with a redox indicator, something that gives you a color as a function of whether it's reduced or oxidized, okay? So that's what's showing you this heterogeneity in what we would think of something that must be homogeneous. And this reaction, when it was first tried to be published in the 1950s, I forget whether it was Belazov or Zabotinsky, the editor said, no, we can't publish this because it goes against the second law of thermodynamics, therefore it can't be true. 
You know, you show them, but look, it's true. You know, it's like marijuana. Look, it's true, but some people can't adapt. And that's really what the basis of where I'm going with this talk is. So we have complexity generating, in fact, an arrow of time. We had prebiotic, pre, uh, prebiotic interactions forming these kinds of organized chemical structures where, where energy and mass flowed. That led to life. Life's essentially a phase change from that perspective. And ultimately, that develops to multicellularity, where you're having cells interacting, communicating, functioning together. And at every step of the way in this evolutionary process, the cannabinoid system took on a unique role in modulating things on up to the level of consciousness, where obviously it has a fundamental role. And, and in many cases, what it's doing is it's modulating free radical activity which I don't want to go into the whole of the details, but that's, in a sense, a sign of imbalance with your environment. What this far from equilibrium thermodynamics says is that we can take energy in from our environment, energy and organization, use it to power our organization, and it's a natural thing as long as we generate more waste. In other words, we can make ourselves smarter by making the universe stupider quicker. And Free radicals play a fundamental role in that. But now we see that cannabinoids are regulating everything, our cardiovascular system, digestive, endocrine, excretory, immune, musculoskeletal, nervous, reproductive, respiratory. And essentially, all age-related diseases are results of imbalances in the balancing acts that emerge as natural processes from this far from equilibrium thermodynamics. So, when endocannabinoid, with endocannabinoids regulating everything, what kinds of unusual new phenomena, holes that are greater than the sum of the parts, might we expect to occur? And on an individual level, ultimately, these things are contributing to health. It's not a single little pathway, which tends to be the way Western medicine is trying to dissect things, but it's a much more holistic pathway where things are all dynamically interacting and creating a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. And uh, in terms of the mind-body connection, you know, it's potentially, I think, the cannabinoid system is really responsible for the placebo effect. So that's something that will have to be looked at. Up until about 100 years ago, the leading cause of death in, you know, quote, civilized societies was infectious diseases. Today, we die from age-related diseases. Well, cannabinoids are essentially anti-aging drugs. They help prevent and slow down the progress of age-related illnesses. We've outlawed it. Duh. So they have a very protective impact on things like cardiovascular disease, neurological dysfunction, autoimmune diseases, and as we just heard, how they can kill a whole number of cancer cells under a variety of experimental conditions. And even though we've known about this for 30 years, 40 years, we're just now starting to get it into humans in, in some clinical work with the help of wonderful people's work like Manuel Guzman's. So cannabinoids facilitate man's interaction with his environment. They counteract stress on a subcellular level. This has to do with the free radicals again. And on, on up the organizational complexity. And what I'm suggesting is it goes beyond the level of an individual and actually includes social consciousness. So free radicals are the friction of life, and endocannabinoids are the oil of life. And I would say they're also the oil of society. And kind of to verify this aging, anti-aging property, this is a uh, slide from Andrea Zimmer's work a while back, 1999. And what you see over here is that knockout mice of the CB1 receptor are dying at a much more rapid rate than the wild type or the heterozygous mice, so mice that either are, are, have both of their intact CB1 genes or have only one. This tells you you need an intact cannabinoid system, yet the system part that gets you high, you need that for life. And the corollary experiment of this was done at the NIH at around the same time because they're always trying to show how bad marijuana is. So they did long-term studies of injecting high doses of THC into mice and rats. And unfortunately for the warriors, the conclusion was that the mice lived longer and had fewer tumors. <laughs> so endocannabinoids have played an increasing role in man's evolutionary history. Where are we going? How is it possible that cannabis is classified as having no medical value? I mean, this is lunacy. You know, you got a million people in a democracy saying, hey, this makes me feel better, it helps me. You got science that agrees with them. You got 5,000 years of history, and yet it's illegal? What's wrong with this situation here? What is the influence of cannabinoids on the behavior of populations? So, there was an experiment done by Lichtman a while back 
with the water maze. You, knock, you take the knockout mice, so they don't have their CB1 receptor. You put them in a, way, a maze that's in water. Mice don't like water. They freak out, they swim around, they find the platform. You can do this with the normal mice, or you can do it with the wild type mice, the same thing. They freak out, they find the platform, they learn where the platform is, you take them out, you put them in, they go to the platform. Now you change the position of the platform. You put the mice in, they freak out, they swim around, they go to where it used to be, it's not there, they freak out, they find the new place. The normal mice, if you take them out, will go to the new place. The mice lacking cannabinoid receptors only go to the old place. They cannot relearn. They're stuck in their way of thinking. Can we extend that to humans? I would say yes. <laughs> so I call them blips, backwards looking people, as opposed to flips, forward looking people. And essentially, it's that that's responsible for what I call the biology of democracy, the balance of blips and flips. Now, in a population, there are, will intrinsically be those who have above average endocannabinoid levels, and particularly with respect to open-mindedness, because that's what we're really looking at here, the ability to relearn, to take in new information and adjust, you know? Marijuana has medical value. Let's get on with it already, you know? So, in a population, there will intrinsically be those who have above average and those who have below average. <laughs> And you know, you can make some guesses as to what might be the case here. I, in fact, think that our president is, is the equivalent of a knockout mouse. <laughs> so neurocognitive correlate, and this is an article that came out right after I presented this, actually, at the Hempfest last year. Neurocognitive correlates of liberalism and conservatism. And this is a paper that basically shows that there's a fundamental difference in the way conservatives versus liberals think. And it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. The whole concept is whether you're open-minded or not. And what they've shown that it has to do with a variety of uh, anterior singlet activity. And that's an area that's also endowed with a lot of cannabinoid receptors. So this kind of supports my whole contention. So what are the real consequences of that? Come on. Lower endocannabinoid levels impair relearning, which I call open-mindedness. Higher levels promote open-mindedness and hence the ability to adapt to a changing environment. In other words, reduce stress, adapt and change. So the hypothesis is that blips, backward-looking people, endocannabinoid def deficient people, more primitive people, they, intent they intrinsically will agree with one another because they're looking at what already happened. That's the way they look. They don't like to look forward because in the future you don't know what's going on and you might have to make some changes. You might have to adapt, but if you don't have the biochemical machinery to adapt, then that's not the way you're thinking. You know, you can either look forward, you can look in the present and experience the now, or you look backwards. So all I'm saying is there's a shift in the distribution of where your views are coming from as a function of how cannabinoid endowed or not you are. So blips gain power by having a greater degree of consensus. The consensus is derived from the fact that they're looking backwards. Of course you can agree more on what's already happened than if you're going to project into the future where what you would do is tend to agree to disagree. Cooperativity, okay? So blips are overrepresented in government because they gain power because they're looking backwards. You know, it, this is so incredible because Man's impact on his environment now demands that we be able to make changes, that we take in new information and we adapt accordingly. The very survival of mankind may be dependent on us making this kind of shift away from having so-called leaders who can't lead because they're looking backwards. Leadership means you go into the future and you take new things and you come up with new ideas and you work together to accomplish something special, something emerging out of, you know, Nonlinear relationships, new concepts. So, conclusion, a higher level of endocannabinoid activity in the human biochemical distribution in the biosphere may be necessary to prevent human extinction. Mankind is engaged in a great genetic battle between more primitive, less cannabinoid endowed individuals and those with more robust cannabinoid systems. 
We need them both. That's the way nature works, balance of opposing forces. But you want to shift things away from where it's been to something new that will provide us with new opportunities and new options for survival. A new paradigm for leadership is necessary. The role of leaders should be to promote positive change. You know, there's no antonym to leaders. To leadership. There's no antonym. I propose our government is the antonym. They are the opposite of leadership. Mankind not, can, cannot genetically evolve fast enough to adapt to the changes and the impact that we're having on the environment to generate the level of open-mindedness that we require. Therefore, <laughs> cannabis prohibition must end. <laughs>